Howdy y'all, Joe Hills here, recording as I always do in Nashville, Tennessee, and I've realized that whether I keep the block as blocks or not, I still need to actually end a pearl up here to the top of the wall, or toward it. Got close, you know. That That's the secret of life. Whoa. Just get by. No, I'm kidding. Um, people were asking me in uh, episode 63's comments, uh, Joe, what do you recommend for when you're blocked creatively? And, whoops, that's actually not how I wanted to do that. We're going to put these here, though, because it's, it's simply fine. It's basically the same. Um, but anyway, people were asking me in episode 63's comments, Joe, what do you do when you get creatively blocked? And I thought I should answer that for you because that is a courteous thing to do when someone asks a question. Now, my kind of general approach to creativity is a lot different from some people who are in if you're working in a structured environment being creatively blocked can be problematic because you have very narrowly defined parameters that could be considered success right like so if i'm trying to solve a programming problem where i'm just like this code should be working and it's a puzzle there's something going on here that i'm not seeing you know, I'll talk through the problem with somebody else, I'll show the code to somebody else, I'll take a break, walk around, come back to it with fresh eyes, you know, all sorts of things that are just basically, you know, hey, I know I'm capable of doing this, but I just need a, a sideways approach at it, you know. And once again, that might not be creatively blocked in the, hey, I'm a screenwriter sense, or hey, I'm George Railroad Martin sense, but like, well, George, if you're watching, I gotta say, you can get a lot done by just doing something. Like, kind of doing anything is better than doing nothing. And so, even though you might not get done exactly what you wanted to get done, you've at least achieved some piece of something. Like, for example, if I was like, hey, I want to make a Minecraft episode about something, but I don't know what it should be about, I might just go, well, I've got some projects started. I'll just go work on something like I need to put blocks along the tops of these walls so they look good these walls will look better once I put these pieces of trim here you know that's just something that is factually true what should that episode be about I don't know in this case I actually do because somebody sent me a question that I'm answering but for the sake of argument you know I might just put these blocks down and then hope that the rest naturally flows out of that Worst case, I could make a montage out of getting the blocks down and then use that as the intro to something else. Um, but usually if I start doing something, I'll come up with something else. Now, these are not the same things as working on a project from scratch or coming up with a project from scratch. Because, you know, I'm just jumping on with the mom I'm leveraging the, adva the, the advantage of the momentum of my aisle. Momentum, dum dum dum. I already have here. I'm talking too fast for myself because I'm trying to pace it with the block placement somehow. Okay. I just need to decouple my mind from the physical act of placing blocks, by which I mean the digital act of placing blocks. So I don't uh, place them in the wrong place or say the wrong thing. Anyway. One thing that I've also realized in terms of like bigger projects, when you're trying to figure out what you want to do in terms of the direction of the project or what you want to start on with it. It helps to do a lot of those same writing exercises that you learn in English class for working on a large essay. Like, hey, write down a few notes about each of the points you want to make and uh, go review your sources and make an index card for each. Because this is basically procrastination. But it's procrastination that feels like you're making progress. And the secret of that is that it keeps your brain active on the problem without forcing your brain to try to solve the problem. So it's a pressure-free way to reacquaint yourself with the problem. And once again, examine it from different angles. Don't fall to your death like that. Also, just side note, um, you know, another thing that I do when I'm kind of in a a kind of creative downturn is I try to spend a lot of time 
deconstructing the works of other people and trying to understand what made those works so successful. Now, that is going to make it sound like I'm in a creative bad spot right now because I'm spending all this time, uh, you know, deconstructing Dungeons and Dragons campaigns and trying to figure out what made them so successful. But that's um, partially true in that the, the Pitfalls and Penguins project, we've been trying to figure out how to make it work with 5th edition. And there's a lot of moving parts to that, and that's a big challenge. So arguably... The answer to how are what do you do when you're creatively blocked adapting your game to Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition? I we look at a bunch of things that Chris Perkins invented for Fifth Edition, like the Death House, and things that Chris Perkins adapted for the Fifth Edition, like the Castle Ravenloft from the I Six module by Tracy and Laura Hickman, and we see what did they learn, what did they apply, and maybe what like we're not trying to do what they did, but we're trying to. Because what they're adapting is very different from what we're adapting, but there are lessons to be learned from watching how other people did the same thing. So, you know, if you're trying to write a story that's funny, maybe go read other stories that are funny or do things that are comedy adjacent. If you're trying to write science fiction and you just really don't want to write science fiction right now, well, for one thing, you are wasting a career that a lot of people really want. But I don't know, go read actual science or go read actual fiction. Look at things that are adjacent to your field, you know, and they'll give you ideas. Because, like, you might read a great article about some sort of new magnetic field thing or something that you're like, oh, well, if you turn that up 800 times, here's the sci-fi implications. Okay, good. That's a story idea. You know, or if you have, uh, you're reading some non-science fiction story, like, oh, here's a story about uh, Hungarians who were fleeing from the Nazis in World War II, which that is a very... There's a lot of really interesting World War II stories out there that have not done well in the English-speaking world because adapting the Hungarian language is difficult. The adaptations that do exist um, generally don't receive a lot of acclaim, but, you know, um, there might be something in those stories that you wouldn't get somewhere else. You know, if you were just, hey, I'm trying to write science fiction, I'm going to read other science fiction. Well... You're going to get better at writing other people's science fiction. If you're like, I'm going to look at, oh, well, actually, those World War II things aren't even fiction. They're just stories. They're things that happen to people in their lives. So now you're two steps removed, but you're learning things that you could possibly pull back in, you know? So kind of don't try to attack the problem head on. Just kind of orbit the problem and you might get a better a better view of the whole thing. So that's just kind of some quick thoughts on that. Uh, let's see. Another thing that I'll often do is I'll find myself reviewing things that I have jotted down as ideas or outlines that I never actually fully fleshed out. So it's like, oh, hey, here's four lines of a poem that I never published because I needed 12. Maybe the other eight lines can't exist. Maybe it's not a good poem. But maybe something about the sentiment of the poem would be good for a story or a, good for an episode of a video like what I'm doing here. Or maybe you could twist so, like a piece of what you wrote before to become a character note for something that you're trying to work on now. And, um, you know, just kind of if, – if it wasn't a good idea in the first place, you might not have written it down. Now, that's not necessarily universally true, but – it probably had some value for you to write it down at all. So trying to figure out if you could apply it here is a helpful exercise just in terms of kind of continuously working on things. But anyway, looks like I need to go grab some more stuff to make concrete, which is, you know, kind of boring. Time skip. Well, the sun is setting once again over Red Sky Bay. Well, I mean, it is. Red Sky Bay's over there. This is just some field. But, you know, I got some stuff done this episode. I got these walls here mostly finished, although clearly I need another line of bricks in front of or above that. Maybe maybe I miscalculated those. Those are different distances from each other. Okay, so I got some things done right this episode. I got th some things done wrong this episode. But I can admit that. Look forward to fixing those and move forward. That is okay. That is fine. We will get by. I hope this has helped you guys 
to cope with any sort of creative blocks you guys have. Once again, the secret is just keep doing something constructive as closely related to whatever you're supposed to be doing as possible. And, uh, you know, hopefully ahead of deadline, you'll come out ahead. So, hello, Chaos. Look at these guys. You guys are all going to be turned into books and then live here forever. Isn't that wonderful? Okay, that's that was morbid. But anyway, this has been a great episode. But before we wrap up, I think I should note that there were no mid-roll ads this episode on account of a Patreon backing by Doman91. So I'm going to read a poem that I wrote which I have entitled, Salaryman. As a salaryman, I spend my waking hours in a vampire building that transfuses my child's youth into her sustenance, her wants into her needs, and her coos into screams. Now that my daughter's a little bit older, she doesn't really scream as much when I leave her at the daycare. But, you know, it really did bother me a lot when she was younger. Like, now she's friendly and socializing and stuff. But when I wrote that, it was definitely frustrating every day. Because she just wanted to be with Daddy and Mommy. And she couldn't be because, unfortunately, the reality of the civilization we live in is that you have to work a lot. And... Anyway, so that's kind of what that poem's about. I usually don't explain the poems afterwards, but that is definitely something I struggle with. And I try to include her in as many of the things I do as I can. So, which is one of the reasons I brought her to, you know, play on Con and why I'm bringing her to PAX San Antonio, PAX South. But anyway, wow, I'm really rambling explaining this. Po good poetry shouldn't need to be immediately explained by the speaker. So... Yeah, but then again, I never said this was good poetry. I just said that Doughboy paid for it. So thank you again to Doughboy91. Until next time, y'all, this is Joe Hills from Nashville, Tennessee. Keep adventuring.